Hey, what's up, everybody? We got another chapter review here. So today we are on chapter six. Sorry for the little, look at that just right here. I'm going to change a little bit of lighting in here just because I don't want it to uh, cause any issues when we're looking at this. So subtle sounds, for those that haven't been watching yet, I would suggest checking out chapters one through five. We've been doing little reviews on each chapter. Um, shout out to Harry Potter, who's uh, yeah, this is the bookmark. But as you can tell, it's not actually see through. But the background's a little green, so it's messing up. But um, yeah, the reason it's ironic that I have that for those that don't know, this book is what we would call Tom Riddled. Has all the highlights or all the relevant parts. So I'll go ahead and get it right here first. So I like to try and get it still excuse me i like to try and get it still and hold on jeez this is a little bit difficult first time's always difficult of the day excuse me so the reason i'm doing this chapter six for those that aren't aware this way you can actually pause the thing um you can actually pause the video and see the full page but we're just going to go through the highlighted parts. I got this book from a local book uh, library or book drop in a neighborhood of mine. Or in my neighborhood, I should say. And yeah, I've been going through it. But yeah, chapter six, our one and only commandment. A day, a dayana meditation. Perhaps we must think that Hunang, however, maintain that Paranja, transcendental wisdom, is inseparable from Dina. Neither can be understood without the other. So what it's saying here is it's been thought that the experience of enlightenment can only be attained after one practice and attain some depth in Dina, meditation. So Dina is meditation, but perhaps some of us still think that. Hoi Nang, however, maintained that with that pran pranja, transcendental wisdom, is inseparable from dhyana meditation. Neither can be understood without each other. So, in other words, you can't have transcendental wisdom without meditation or self-reflection. And I would concur. There are three flips, three steps of dis forms of discipline in our practice. The first is siya, saya, moral precepts against stealing, gossiping, coveting, etc. The second is Danya, or Zen, and the third is Pranya. If I'm mispronouncing these, let me know how the pronunciation in the comments down below. Hui Neng is said for that true understanding, we must know that Danya is not different from Pranya, and that Pranya is something attained after practicing Zen. When we are practicing in this very moment of practicing, Pranya is unfolding itself in every single aspect of our lives. Sweeping the floor, washing the dishes, cooking the food, everything we do. All right. Next up right here. There's that one. I just want to make sure for those at home, if you're listening to just the audio, I'm just holding up the book right now to get these two pages. Excuse me. Do, do, do. Wow. That is so confusing. It's like the video is backwards from. It's just very difficult to like maneuver this correctly. Sorry about that. Let's keep it going here. So. 28. No, no knowing is what we do. As it is a famous phrase from the Bada Harama. Member of Chinese. Who is this who stands before us? No knowing. No knowing. There is no way that we can take this intuitive mind and quantify it. We can say here it is. Going to give you one month or two months worth. Now we have so it goes on to say here at the end of this little thing where it's highlighted. It says, "Forgetting all, uh, forget all about gaining anything. We are simply trying to see clearly." 
It's a good way of summarizing meditation. You're not trying to really gain anything. And if you're trying to gain something, it's almost like you're not doing it for the right right reason to begin with. This kind of seeing, this kind of understanding is as it is this. As it is this. We are here for the sake of all sentient beings, and we are one with all sentient beings when we came, come to see this as it isness. What about paying attention to what it is that makes us feel and think this way? Where does this come from? A couple more pages here. One more second here. There's that one. And I'm also looking at like the screen of like what I'm displaying here just to make sure that you guys are going to be able to get a good look at it. Because if I can't see it, then I'm assuming you guys wouldn't be able to either. Excuse me, sorry. Perfect. All right. So 30, we keep it going here. Through clarifying our minds, we can abandon our delusions and enlighten ourselves. Through clarifying our minds, we can abandon our delusions and enlighten ourselves. Okay, so I was just looking at this, and I read a little bit of it, so I'll read it out loud, actually. So it says, um, so let us see clearly. Let us put all past aside and go deeply into this, moment after moment. How do we do it? Just by our own natural breathing. If we try to slow our breath down, it becomes awkward and uncomfortable. Instead, we narrow the breath. When we exhale, we narrow the exhalation in what is called bamboo breath. When we inhale, we don't take in a big, great gulp of air. We just a little, with just a little, just enough. By breathing like this, more air is retained in the lungs, and it's quite naturally the breathing slows down. The transition from inhalation to exhalation becomes smoother. Sitting becomes joyful. It is an immeasurable pleasure just to breathe in zazen. Just to breathe, just to see clearly. This is the real meaning of the precepts. If it comes down, if it comes from the hara, from the intuitive wisdom mind, then it can be done. Our one and only commitment in intuitive practice and response to our lives is if we pray, if we pay absolute attention to this, it is really difficult to violate. I'm going to read that part again, sorry. Let me do this actually, get the lighting a little better over here. All right. So it says, if we come from the hara, from the intuitive wisdom mind, then it can be done. But in our practice, our one only commandment is intuitive response to our lives. And if we pay absolute attention to this, it really is difficult to violate. Chapter 7, Breathing In and Breathing Out. We'll come back to that tomorrow. Um, some thoughts on this chapter for me personally, and as always, let me know your thoughts on the highlights in the comment section down below. But I talked about it, I think it was on yesterday's, on Chapter 5's breakdown and discussion, that meditating is a really profound thing that, it kind of fortifies you internally. And I guess to expound upon that, because I was thinking about it last night and into this morning, I was thinking about, um, so the way I kind of visualize or conceptualize meditation is imagine 
like your bedroom or imagine your house or imagine just a place where you live and in that place imagine kind of like chaos or disorder uh nothing is organized everything's kind of chaotic or sporadic and it's like you have like some general semblance of where everything is but at the same time it's not as clean or as as efficient or as productive as it could be the space you're in so now think of that being like a physical space but now think of your brain and it being a mental space so you can't see inside your thoughts but if it helps to think of it this way think of your brain as kind of like your house it's where all your mental thoughts are or your mental belongings all your mental objects it also houses your spiritual and um kind of like uh anything in the metaphysical space or anything in the um in a space where it's not in the physical realm like you know it's not like uh, it's not like here physically, like I can't grab it, but there are, they are memories and they were tangible at some point because just when I grabbed this a minute ago, it's like I set it down, but I can think about when I just had it a minute ago and that's a memory and it has to go somewhere in this mental house. It could be maybe thrown out or discarded or kept it way back in the, in the storage room, uh, behind the building. But regardless, it's going to be a part of of you. And so what I'm trying to say here is that by meditating, you're able to kind of like organize and sift through and start structuring your, your brain or your mental uh, pathways, you can start organizing them and kind of decluttering them. You can revisit things in a quicker, more expedient way you have a better understanding of everything you do have in there and when people ask you things you can respond in a very quick and thoughtful way and i think that this is going to get a little deep and this is just me having a thought about it right now but excuse me i think that with with like us having like with meditation okay It's like we as people don't have ever a moment of just quiet, especially nowadays with cell phones, with screens, with everything. You don't have like a moment to yourselves. And I feel like in the two years I've been meditating, I don't know if it's just because of COVID and I was at home more. I've also been reading more. I haven't been going out as much. But I guess I'm wondering, is meditation, because nowadays people are always like, Ethan, you're so smart. And I appreciate them saying that, but at the same time, like, I don't feel like I'm any smarter or dumber than anyone else on this planet. I think that, and this is the only difference, I think that the difference is, is that I'm curious. I just naturally wonder about things. I'm not, you know, like in the book, it's like I'm not gossiping or stealing or doing anything that's like hurting anybody. Um, And... To me, I guess I just see it is the fact that we can't be quiet and the fact that we can't be alone with our thoughts and the fact that we are constantly like moving from one thing to the next, whether it be like mentally or physically, like the consumerism that's enveloped the West. I think that the thing that's different with meditation is it's based in like an anti-consumerism mindset. If you look at some of the Buddhists and the monks and some of the people who practice meditation on a daily basis for their li- most of their lives, you'll see that these people are very detached from the physical items that surround them. They're very like, okay. And I think that that is because deep down you can start to realize your own value in the world and that these items, they don't have any value without you. They wouldn't exist here without you. Yes, they were made by other people, but the only reason they were made is because we as a society will in some way want them. But imagine if nobody wanted anything. Nothing would be made. So it's almost like we've now become like spiritually bankrupt as a society in the last couple of years. And I think that kind of plays into COVID uh, because so many people were able to be home, but it was, and I'm guilty of it, 
it's like, yes, I was meditating, but yes, I was also on Amazon a lot and doing other things a lot that were unbecoming of someone who's trying to be a productive, spiritually sound person. You can fill in the blanks there. I don't want to say anything too controversial on the internet. Um, not in this video, at least. But yeah, I think that if you've made it this far in the video and you want to know, I guess the overall message I'm trying to say here is is that don't be spiritually bankrupt. Um, make some deposits into this, your spiritual bank. The best way to do that is to meditate. Every time you meditate, you're depositing money into your spiritual bank. And every day you don't, and every day you live kind of these baseline hedonistic values or live these very short-sighted, uh, short-serving like goals of gratification. Every time you do that, you're withdrawing money from your spiritual bank. And that's not something you will always have to do. And some people get their spirituality from other ways other than meditating. Maybe they go to church or maybe they volunteer within their community. But when you're doing stuff you don't really want to do, but you're doing it because you know it's the right thing to do, that's a good indicator of you're getting spiritual currency. It's like when you go volunteer, um, help pass out food to homeless people during the holidays. Shout out to me. I did that. But uh, that's not like the only reason I mentioned that. I didn't mention that on any social media. I didn't mention that to anyone. The only reason I'm mentioning it to you now is because it's relevant to this story. But the point is, is like when you go and do stuff like that or you volunteer maybe at your local animal shelter, um, volunteer at your local food bank, when you do these things and you help out people without receiving anything in return, you are getting spiritual currency, in my opinion. Same thing with meditation. When you meditate, you're not getting anything from meditating. If anything, you would presumably be losing stuff because you're not doing something that could make you money. You're not using your time to go and handle whatever businesses you have or whatever endeavors you need to take care of or, you know, handle. You aren't doing that. And so you're kind of compromising maybe like a physical financial value for a spiritual one, in which case... You have your whole life to chase finances and chase material possessions. But if you can, I'd recommend taking five to ten minutes a day, first thing in the morning, um, to meditate. Best case scenario, do it before you get on your phone and start scrolling. And better yet, just don't get on your phone while you're in your bed. That would be my advice too. But be safe out there. We're going to get to Chapter 7 here tomorrow. But um, I just want to give you guys a little insight into what's going on in my life there. And if you have some similar stories to share or similar thoughts, uh, similar opinions, views, anything like that, I really would love to hear from you. Uh, drop a comment down below. You can always message me directly. Um, you can message me on Instagram at eFlyingCo or at eFly7. Um, at eFlyX is my other YouTube channel. It's currently on a two-week ban. It's a story for another time, but... Um, yeah, regardless, I appreciate you guys being here, and I hope that you know I mean that. So thank you. Take care, and I will see you very soon. You fly out. Peace and love, baby.